As a filmmaker, to me, sound is literally 50% of the experience of making films. Uh, sound and music. Visuals and story and sound and music. I think that proper attention to sound in a film can elevate the sum of its parts to something much more than expected. And you can really give the viewer an experience that they're not expecting, especially when you're doing things um, subtly and tweaking the uh, expectations of the narrative by doing things to the sound that the viewer's not aware of. Hi, my name is Graham Resnick. I'm the writer, director, and creator of Dead Wax, and I'm also the uh, composer and sound design and mixer. I like to think of what I do as destructive audio design, taking the initial properties of a sound and destroying them to the point where they create an entirely new experience from the original audio, retaining the essence of the original, but in a new format. In this particular plug-in template that I'm going to show you that I've created for Dead Wax, I've taken a simple bass line and turned it into a massive sound of destruction and distortion. So we start with a really simple, pretty basic synth bass patch, which is one repeated note with uh, two additional notes that come in a little later down the line. This is what it sounded like beforehand. It's clean and it's big and it's thick, but it's just not what's right for the show, which is all about the destruction of audio and getting into this like crunchy, over-amplified and super limited space so everything's just breaking up like an old tape or an old record. which works perfectly for the show because it mirrors the degradation of the psyche of the characters as they're descending into a, a madness that's been brought on by the, uh, the records that they're listening to. So in order to go from the clean version, we have the main source, which has a number of plugins down here, and then we're breaking it up into three tracks of additional parallel processing. A crunch, a phase, and a low-end boost. And then that's all going through one group bus, which is doing some additional limiting things, uh, which are really fun. Uh, and then that's doubled on the second part of the line down here, the second part of the bass line. But we'll just look at the first part for now, since it's basically the same. Each one of these sections of parallel processing does something very specific, but we're going to turn them off and just look at what's happening on the source. I'm also going to turn off the master bus plugins as well, so that we can see just what's happening to the source. And you can see here I've got NLS channel, R bass, the PS22 spreader, real ADT stereo, R verb stereo, TG12345 from Abbey Rhodes, vitamin, R verb again, and J37. I'll open them all up for you and we can see what we're doing because I think you'll see that each one of these things adds a subtle nuance, um, which is kind of nice. So opening up the NLS channel, I like to put NLS channel at the head of all of my tracks whenever I'm mixing, because NLS gives you additional control over the gain staging of pretty much every element of your audio when you're mixing tons of tracks, and you can set a group bus for everything. So, for example, I have this set to group bus 2 with the label synth, and that ends up in a master NLS. If you put an NLS channel on every one of your audio tracks, they will all talk to each other and be controllable from this master NLS bus window, which is really nice. So the next one I have on here is our bass. And I like our bass quite a bit because you can boost the low end frequencies in a really clean and pleasant way. This is with our bass off, and this is with our bass on. And that just gives me a little bit more low end to work with. And the next one I have here is the PS22 spreader, really great for taking a stereo signal and pushing it even further out into the stereo field. I really want to take the sound, spread it out, and have the sides just kind of sizzle and crackle, which we'll do a little bit more with in the parallel processing. But using the PS22 spreader here allows me to create a signal that I can then modify in the parallel processing. So the next thing we have is the real ADT stereo. And Real ADT is a Abbey Road emulation plugin, which creates a very speed effect, but it also has all these additional interesting components like drive, 
um, and an LFO that can control the VARA speed. And this is a pretty simple use of it. But as you can hear, there's almost a little bit of flange, like a little phasey kind of sound. Like it adds just a little bit of nice movement to it. It's very subtle. But it's something that gets amplified as it passes through the additional filter. This is one of my favorite plugins to use, especially on synths, to make them sound bigger and more alive, a little less perfect. Very speed kind of lets the pitch warp and change a little bit. It's not as steady, which is really nice, especially when you're going to be destroying the sound through overdrive, because then you have a little bit more variation to the crunchiness that comes in. And the next thing we have is R verb. So again, this is before, and this is after. Arverb is one of my absolute favorites. It's probably 10 years, 15 years after I first started using it, one of my go-to plugins for nearly every track. I like to bring Arverb in because it's very CPU friendly and has a lot of different controls that you can really dial in a great EQ sound. What this is doing specifically is giving a sustain to these very short bass notes. And that sustain then, when compressed later, uh, allows the bass note to sound bigger and longer and fuller than it actually was in the recording. And as you can see here, I have given it a, a decay time of three seconds, a little bit of early reflections. The wet dry I have up pretty high at 41%. Usually when I'm just putting this on a on an instrument, I keep it much lower. But the, the wet dry here at 41% really allows it to blend with the source and sound like one long, full sound. So here, take a listen to it again. So this is with the wet dry a lot lower and really high. Now the problem is, of course, if you raise your wet too high, the source loses a lot of punch. So I keep it a little below 50 at 41%. So we still have a nice punch, but it still draws the sound out in a really pleasing way. And I've lowered a little of the low end here under 250 because I don't want it to get too boomy and I've taken down the, uh, the high end as well. So the next plugin up is TG12345, which is an emulation of an Abbey Road Studio console. I've never used an original. I have no idea what the original sounds like, but I love the way this plugin sounds and what it does to a sound. It's got a lot of really nice features that allow you to tweak elements of the audio in a destructive way, um, which may or may not be what the plugin's intended for, but it's the way I like to use it. And I think you can get a very sweet, clean sound from it, but you can also get a really grungy, pleasing, grimy sound from it. And it's even got this uh, drive feature down here too, which uh, leads me to believe that it is one of the intended features. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, I have the input cranked all the way to 24 because I just wanted to see how far I could push this thing. Let's take a listen to it uh, before and after and see what it does. This is before. And this is after. So you can see that really alters the property of this audio. It flattens it, it crushes it, but it also lifts up all of those things like that long sustain from the reverb. And you really start to hear that sizzle on the sides, which is something we started working on with the PS222 spreader. And now with this, we're amplifying and pointing out even further. So you can see here, I've just blasted the input to, uh, to 24. I've taken the output down to negative 12 because a lot of times when you over crank the input and lower the output, then you get that really, really pleasing tube-like uh, saturation and distortion. I have the limiter all the way up and I have the limiter just crushing the sound. With the EQ, I've taken the treble down a little bit because I got a little too brittle up there for my taste and uh, boosted the bass because since it was a little brittle, I wanted to bring back a little bit of that low end and make sure it, it maintained. But the main thing I'm doing here uh, on the right is spreading it all the way to six on this meter. The spreader is really, really nice. Let's take a listen to what it does. So that's the way it is now at six. This is down to negative 12. It basically makes it mono, the original, and then spread out. And I have the drive up just a little bit because we're doing a lot of other drives in here in different ways, but I wanted to give it a little bit of extra kick. So that's as it is. This is all the way down. Crank it even further. There's like a frequency sweep that happens, like. 
So I just wanted a little bit of that movement. So I left it fairly conservative because I didn't want it to be the whole characteristic of the sound, but just getting a little bit of it in there adds another element of that humanization and that movement and that texture that we can then amplify through all the additional compressors. So the next plugin we have on our main source audio is the Vitamin. And Vitamin's a really fun plugin. What it's doing is taking the low end and consolidating the image just a little bit more towards the center and allowing the punch to be a little more pronounced, as well as using some of the harmonic saturation effects in the upper mid-range uh, to enhance the sizzle a little bit. So let's take a look. Taken the low mid and the low, and I've pulled their stereo image narrower. So where we spread everything out earlier with the PS22 spreader, now I'm taking the lows and I'm bringing them a little bit back towards the center. So that they're a little punchier, um, and a little harder when they hit. Sometimes when you have low end spread out into the stereo field, um, it comes off a little deflated. It doesn't really hit quite as hard. So we can take a listen to that. This is just the low end soloed. And bypassed. It's a little hard to hear, but if you have headphones on, you might be able to hear just how spread out that low end is when it's bypassed and then what the width control here is doing. Um, and then in the high end, this is the high mid, and this is bypassed. So it's just bringing out a little bit of extra sizzle and presence. Okay, then we have Arverb again. And you might be asking why I'm using Arverb a second time. It's a good question. So this is before. This is after. Now it's a really subtle thing, but in the high end, you can hear kind of a shh or a spray that happens with the with the second R verb. And I treat the first R verb not as an actual reverb effect, but as a way to change the ADSR envelope of the source material. And then this is acting as the reverb on top of the patch. So even though I'm using two reverbs here, one is acting almost more as just like a, a part of the original synth patch, and the second one is working as a reverb sound on top of that. So it's not doing a ton, but it's adding a three and a half second decay, 18%, it's not that 40%, it's down to 18, so it's just a subtle extra tail on the sound. Make it sound like a little more like it's in a space, just to sound bigger and more spacious. It does sound dry before, and then you add this in, and it sounds like it's in a, in a space. And the last thing I have on the source channel by itself is J37. J37 is a tape emulation plugin. This is one of those plugins I like to bring up and just play around with and see what I can find. So let's hear this before and after, and then I'll show you what it's doing exactly. This is before, and this is after. So as you can hear, it's kind of flattened the sound back out again. It's kind of normalized everything to uh, a similar dynamic. I've set it to the low IPS setting, 7.5, cranked the in, lowered the output. I've also taken the wow and flutter, and I've set it to a slightly low rate and a slightly deep setting so that you get just a little bit of warble in there and it's just a little more unsteadiness. As you can see, there's a theme here with trying to give everything sort of like an unexpected movement and texture so that nothing's rigid and nothing's cold. It all has this kind of unexpected organic movement to it. Especially when we start overdriving things or as we've been overdriving things, that adds just so much pleasing movement to the audio. So that is the first pass of the source baseline. And if you remember the before is like this. And the after is like this. And then we have three more phases that it gets sent through, three more additional pieces of parallel processing and a master bust effect. So it's a very, very simple sound that doesn't have a whole lot to it, uh, but we've taken it and we've, we've crushed it into something entirely new and we're adding lots and lots of nuance and depth. You could take a sound like this and just run it through a distortion pedal and you'd get a pretty cool sound. Um, but I'm kind of obsessive about having control of every tiny little piece of a uh, piece of the spectrum and of the feel of a, of a piece of designed audio. So 
doing this kind of very large template where I have all these different plugins and all these different parallel processing allows me to get really deep into all of the nuances of every element of the audio, which we'll continue to go through in the parallel processing.